Hello again, I'm Eric Liu. I'm the CEO of Citizen University, proud member of the Civics Now Coalition. Uh, and I'm so, so grateful for everybody being part of the Civics Now Summit and being back on the second day. As my friend and colleague, Stephen Hines said uh, a moment ago before that really stirring video, um, why wouldn't you come back? And uh, uh, what we're about to close with here um, is a remarkable conversation by uh, three uh, American civic heroes, um, David Rubenstein, Ken Burns, and Lonnie Bunch, uh, I think are known to you all. And I just want to say a, a very brief word about each of them and why this conversation, not only about their work, but their take uh, on what it means for us to teach civics, practice civics, live civics, and appreciate civics, whatever age and stage we may be at in our lives. Um, I, I literally can't think of three people uh, to have a better conversation uh, on this topic. Um, David Rubenstein you know, is often described as a philanthropist uh, uh, with a great patriotic bent. Uh, I actually would flip it around. He's a patriot uh, with a great philanthropic bent. Uh, and his uh, philanthropy has been responsible for things that range from this summit uh, in part to uh, the refurbishment of the Washington Monument and many other things that have been for the good of our country. Uh, uh, Ken Burns, uh, uh, needs no introduction, although in the green room I was talking about uh, needing to kind of practice my left jab because last night I was staying up late uh, watching episode three of his most recent uh, work, a PBS documentary on Muhammad Ali, uh, which I encourage you all to tune into and catch up on. Uh, just uh, an astounding piece of work. And then last but not least, uh, Lonnie Bunch, who leads the Smithsonian Institution um, and uh, prior to that had to help birth and launch the uh, National a museum on African-American history, um, and one of the rare people uh, who can be so deeply an institutionalist with such a great American institution and so profoundly an innovator uh, as well. Uh, and so it's just a gift uh, to have this conversation with the three of them. And I want to turn it over to David to lead this conversation. And then after their panel, I will return uh, with some sum uh, summing up thoughts um, on this summit and our work ahead. Thank you very much, Eric. And uh, thank you, uh, Ken and Lonnie, for being here. So, Ken, did you always have an interest in history when you were young? Or did you, didn't, you, didn't you want to be a scientist or something important like a private equity investor? <laughs> well, no, private equity was number one uh, for sure, David. But uh, my father was a cultural anthropologist, and I had on um, above the, a map above my bed that showed not just the political divisions of the states of the lower 48, uh, Alaska and Hawaii had not yet joined, uh, but the nations, the Indian Native American tribes that also occupied it. So I spent a good deal of my childhood sort of dreaming about that, where my brother read novels, I read encyclopedias and works of history, but didn't really realize that that was my bent. I wanted to be a filmmaker from an early age, and I just ended up uh, practicing the craft of storytelling in American history, which is mostly made up of the word story plus high, which is a good way to begin a story. Okay. Lonnie, when you were growing up, did your parents say, we want you to be a doctor or a lawyer or even private equity person? Or how did you get into history? Well, you know, clearly I was one of those kids that didn't listen to my parents who said that I should have gotten to private equity. Um, but what for me, it was history was the opportunity to understand myself. I grew up in a town where there were very few African-Americans. There were people that treated me wonderfully, people that treated me horribly. And I thought, if I could understand history, first of my town, then of the nation, I might understand more about me and then more about how issues of race has been crucially important for this nation. So for me, it was both an escape, but also an opportunity to learn more about what was shaping my own life. Um. Ken, when you did your Civil War series, which was the epic 10-piece series, um, did you know in advance that that was going to change the world of documentary television, or were you worried that this maybe was not going to work? Well, up to that point, David, I had made six or seven films, all had been an hour or an hour and a half long in American history that were, uh, for the times and for my nascent uh, professional life, very, very successful to Oscar nominations and, um, you know, good audiences on PBS. Nothing prepared me for what happened with the Civil War. Uh, you know, one would like to say that it had to do with the artistry of the series. I think more important, I think it was an understanding that the country at that point, 1990 is when it came out, about this time, um, September 23rd, actually, 1990, um, 
the country was hungry. This is the most important event in American history. And as Lonnie said, and of course, the reason what makes Lonnie such a great teacher is because his interest in history is born in that local interior thing of who am I, uh, along with who are we? And that's been an important part of his journey, and I think mine as well. Uh, I realized that the Civil War was the most important event in American history. I realized that Americans were laboring under the terrible shadow of two reprehensible works of popular history called Birth of a Nation and Gone with the Wind, which would postulate that the cause of the Civil War was not slavery, but things like um, states' rights or nullification or interposition, um, that slavery had nothing to do with it. And, uh, and in both those films, um, the heroes at one point were the Ku Klux Klan, which is a homegrown Al Qaeda or ISIS organization. It seemed really clear that somehow we had forgotten our history. And one of the huge importance uh, reasons why we wish to have a continuity in civics in our history is to make sure that these kinds of big lies, this was the original big lie, don't take place again. And so the Civil War was a way to say, as our first chapter did, this is about slavery. The South Carolina Articles of Secession do not once mention states' rights or nullification. They mention slavery over and over again. And yet we've grown up sort of believing, well, it wasn't really about that. Slaves were kind of happy not having freedom, which is not true. And that the Civil War did not solve many things, uh, but it did change us from a country that saw themselves as a collection of states into a one thing. We used to say the United States are plural. Now we say the United States is actually ungrammatical. And in a way, the Civil War series was an attempt to sort of chart the change of that that verb, and also to understand the extraordinary unfinished business that we inherited from it. So Lonnie, you are the uh, secretary of the Smithsonian, and you have, I think, 19 museums, and you're building two more. But why do we need all these museums? Why don't we just uh, watch films or just watch things on the internet? What's the advantage of having museums as a way to educate people about history? Well, I think, as you know, most people get their history not out of classrooms anymore. They get them out of films, but also museums. And museums are very trusted. And for me, what is powerful about museums is, first of all, the fact that you have these amazing collections, these artifacts that speak to people, help people understand the Civil War or the migration from the South to the North. Um, and so I think what I love is that you create around artifacts informal communities people who don't know each other come together and have conversations. And as a result of those conversations, they're changed. They think about things in different ways. So in some ways, museums are this great civic space that are safe for people who disagree on many things to come together and grapple with history or climate change. So for me, what museums are, are they're the glue that helps hold a nation together. So uh, Lonnie, um uh, Ken talked about slavery and that uh, original sin in our Constitution. Um, was it easy to build the African American History and Culture Museum? Was there great demand in Washington for a century or so to get that built? And when you got to be responsible for it, did people give you a lot of money to get it built? <laughs> you know, I think that the notion of talking about race has always been a challenge in this country. And to build a museum on the mall that really said that you can't understand America if you don't understand the African-American experience, I think there were people like you that were very supportive, but there were many who felt that maybe this didn't need to be on the mall. Uh, maybe this is a story that was more divisive. And my goal was to create a museum that said, yes, you will hear stories that will make you cry, that will make you angry but you'll also find moments of resiliency and moments of joy. And you'll recognize that this story of the African-American in some ways is the quintessential American story. It's the story that profoundly shapes us all. And what I wanted more than anything else was to make sure that anybody who came in that museum, regardless of who they are, first of all, would be changed by the experience. But secondly, they would recognize that this is my story too. And that, to me, was really the most important power of that museum. And that really motivated us to actually get something done that only took 11 years to bring to fruition. And how much did it cost? 
it cost $570 million, of which Congress probably paid a little less than half. And then um, many people um, gave significant amounts of money and many people just joined as $25 or $50 members. And in essence, this really became, I would argue, a museum that reflected the best of America. People crossed racial lines to build it. People from different classes contributed. And in essence, it became an opportunity to remind us of America at its best when people come together for the greater good. So Ken, after you, the Civil War series, and you became even more famous than before, and you were a national figure, why didn't you go to Hollywood and say, I'm gonna be the next Steven Spielberg, I'll just do it in documentaries, and I'll make a lot of money and be very rich and live in Malibu. How come you didn't do that? <laughs> well, you know, the telling of history uh, is a complicated and, and time consuming as just the creation of Lonnie's amazing uh, museum, our amazing museum, uh, testifies. Uh, my Vietnam War film took 10 and a half years. I could go to any streaming service, any studio, any premium cable channel. And with my track record, as you suggest, I would easily have gotten the funding, in that case, a little bit north of $30 million. What they would not have given me and what PBS gave me uh, was the, the, the time it would take. They would have said, sure, great, two years. And then the kind of story that we would have told, and this applies to anything, our most recent film on Muhammad Ali, on the history of country music, on the national parks, on the Dust Bowl, all of those, uh, as we know in our own lives, all real meaning accrues in duration. And I think having, in the case of Lonnie's Museum, the federal government behind it gave it the light, it could continue to breathe as a possibility uh, while the rest of us cut off. You know, PBS has one foot tentatively in the marketplace and the other very proudly out. And I've stayed with them my entire professional career. Um, and I've stayed in the same house in New Hampshire as a result to keep the overhead low. In, but but it allows me to, every time we finished a film, to present to the American people, and I agree with Lonnie, to all of the American people. Um, remember, it's what, what his museum does is tell stories. What I do is tell stories. The novelist Richard Powers says, the best arguments in the world won't change a single person's mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story. And we're in the business of telling true, real stories that have the possibility of actually rearranging people's molecules. So I've stayed in public television because I'm reaching tens of millions of people, as Lonnie is with his extraordinary sets of museums now, uh, but also because we're allowed to tell a, a deep dive, do a deep dive, tell a complicated story with, with nuance. What I'd like to say, David, is that I've spent nearly 50 years making films about the US, but I've also spent those 50 years making films about us. That is to say, the two letter lowercase plural pronoun that complement complements the plural, uh, the capital US, all of the intimacy of us and all of the majesty, the complexity, the contradiction, and even the controversy of the US. And if you've got that kind of privileged space, there's no reason to go anywhere else where a suit is going to tell you, eh, I don't think people are interested in African American history. Uh, I don't think this is central to who we are. And let's remember, we were born under the sign that all men are created equal. The guy who wrote it owned hundreds of human beings. And you, you, we, we relegate, and I know why, the study of African American history to black history to February, our coldest and shortest month, when it is, as Lonnie suggests, at the center of our national narrative and deserves not only a space on the National Mall, but, but, but an interpretation that is central to understanding who we are. And it, it speaks to civics, it speaks to history, it speaks to the kind of personal stories that seem to have animated both me and Lonnie on our own journeys. So uh, Ken, one other question before I go back to Lonnie. Um, are your students people that watch your films? Are these high school or junior high school or college students or is it adults or older people like me that just wanna kind of look at a nostalgic uh, look at America? Who are the, your viewers? Well, I, uh, first of all, I would reject the term nostalgia or sentimentality. That's the enemy of good anything. Uh, good private equity can't be nostalgic or sentimental, and good history can't be nostalgic or sentimental. Uh, initially, our broadcasts are viewed by a 
pretty wide swath of the American public, but it skews older uh, it, across the board, African-American uh, as well as white, some Hispanic. We'd like to increase those numbers and are working very hard to do that. But then what's so great about PBS is that it, it is not like most broadcast television, skywriting, uh, disappearing in the first breeze and the first zephyr. But in fact, the films like The Civil War, which is now 31 years old uh, tomorrow, uh, have a life, a daily life in schools. And so in elementary schools and in colleges, these films are used and reused over the decades. And it makes, you know, people are fond of saying that history repeats itself. It does not. Mark Twain, as I think we all know, is fond of saying history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. If he did say that, he understands it completely. Human nature doesn't change. The Bible, Ecclesiastes says, uh, there's nothing new under the sun. And our own stories prove that. Whenever we tell a story in American history, we touch against enduring American themes that are always there about freedom, about race, about leadership, about innovation, about hard times, about politics, about war. All these sorts of things occur and reoccur. And you can be sure that anything you do in American history is going to speak to the present moment, which allows you a table around which people can convene. The safe space that Lonnie described his museum is. And so what I'm thrilled is that these evergreen themes that populate the films are therefore edge evergreen in our educational outreach. And as you know, PBS has its own learning media. They've got the largest classroom in the country and they reach out to every other classroom in the country. But we've also experimenting with more public platforms like Unum, which celebrate the, the kind of ways in which the ideas that are present in our films speak to and connect with the past. And so we're curating a lot of those evergreen ideas into kind of, if you will, mixtapes that permit us to deal with contemporary events without the, the sort of onus of a, of a political dialectic that, e that either turns off or turns on half of the audience when what you want is everyone's attention. Lonnie, um, we are in a technology race with China. Um, so, you know, STEM education is very important, many people have to say. How can we afford to take time to have students learn about history when we're in this technology race against China and we can fall way behind? So histories might be nice, but why do we really need to learn history? Because we, we got to worry about the Chinese, don't we? Well, the, the truth of the matter is that history is foundation that history gives us so many things. It gives us a reservoir to dip into for inspiration, a reservoir to dip into for clarity. But what it also does is forces us to grapple with ambiguity. In some ways, one of the great challenges, regardless of what we're doing, is we often look for simple answers to complex questions. But history forces us to grapple with ambiguity. It forces us to understand debate nuance, shades of gray. And isn't that important as you begin to move to this race with China? In essence, I don't believe that a great nation can move forward without being steeped in its history and without using that history to challenge, to inspire, to prod. In many ways, the great strength of history is that it isn't about yesterday, that it's about today and tomorrow. And that for me, history is a living, breathing entity that makes us better and saves us from ignorance when we don't pay attention to the lessons of the past. Lonnie, when I was in grade school in Baltimore, my teachers would drive us occasionally. We'd take a bus over to the Smithsonian to see the museums. And um, still, school children still come to the museums in big numbers, or is that, are they lost interest in your museums? Well, you know, when you were talking about sort of technology and change, one of the things we found is that for many young, young Americans, they grew up in a virtual world and they're desperate to see the authentic, to see the actual. And so what we still have are thousands of school children coming to the Smithsonian. The challenge now is to make sure that we do even a better job with those students, find ways to make sure people can afford the buses that brought you in from Baltimore, and then utilize technology to make sure that the tens of thousands of kids who will never get to Washington reap the benefit of the wonders of the Smithsonian. Because I think, as I believe like Ken, that in some ways, history 
is too important just to be in the hands of historians and that it really ought to be something that shapes school children. And so we're thinking of the different ways we can engage kids because often people come to history late in life. We want people to come to history much earlier and use it as a tool to give them an understanding and help them live the lives and deal with the challenges they face today. So Ken, um, in the many years you've been doing this, you say almost 50 years uh, or so, um, what has been the biggest change in the way documentary filmmaking is done? And what have you most learned about the documentary filmmaking uh, genre that you now apply that you didn't know, you know 30 or 40 years ago? Oh, I think it's changed in so many wonderful ways. I think, you know, I remember in the in the 1980s, we all felt that we were in a golden age of documentary. And each year since has been an even more improved golden age of documentary. Technology has been extraordinarily helpful. Um, but I've been one who has been reluctant to embrace it right off the bat. I didn't want the technological tail to wag the dog. So I delayed behind my colleagues before I accepted computer editing. I delayed another decade before I accepted um, the movement away from film itself into digital uh, video sorts of things. And, and that helped me control the technology and use it in the best service of the ideas. It's interesting, David, I'd almost answer that more things are the same. The same laws of storytelling that Aristotle detailed in Poetics are the same laws of storytelling that Steven Spielberg himself still adheres to, he can make stuff up, I can't, that Lonnie has to consider as he even presents and arranges the physical spaces in his various museums. This is central to how we do. You know, somebody says, honey, how was your day? Doesn't begin, I back slowly down the driveway, avoiding the garbage can at the curb. So when Lonnie is addressing the, this thing, and we, we, we tried to make it into an either or about STEM and STEAM, it's not. I remember when I was starting off, I looked at about 12 years old. I'm trying to raise money from a senior, senior executive at AT&T in Lower Manhattan for a film about the Brooklyn Bridge. Everyone and his brother has slammed the door and said, this child is trying to sell me the Brooklyn Bridge. We, we developed a friendship and this man now, now passed away said, you know, I wish I had all of my guys were you had gone and taken the humanities courses. Um, I, I, I've got all these MBAs and they don't know how to write a letter. They don't know about ethics. They don't know about history. They don't know what came first. They don't understand uh, complicated relationships, comparative religion, the nuance and the contradictions, the undertow that Lonnie was was describing. And and he said, I can teach you all the things you need to know to be an executive here, but I can't go back and teach them the civics and the history. And civics isn't just 100 senators and 435 representatives. Representatives. It's how you get things done, how you work together to improve. I live in a tiny little town here. A big deal is why when we spend $350,000 on a new pumper, a new fire truck, that's a big deal. And we talk about it. Hundreds of us get engaged in that process, that civic process. And right now we've permitted as a result of these technological changes and also our inclinations and our worries and our competitions that we think that we can jettison that. And all of this is atrophied. STEM is about one plus one equaling two, and it does. But the humanities, civics, history adds the dimension that sometimes that equation equals something more. One plus one equals at least three. And all of us in our life, in our faith, in our art, in our, our reason, in our relationships, look for that. And the only guide you're gonna get that is in history, is in civics, is in the story of us and the story of the U.S. So Lonnie, there's a story that uh, George Washington's father used to say to him when he was a little boy, your generation isn't going to amount to very much. Now, the point being that every senior generation always tells the younger generation, well, we were much better when we were younger and you guys are not going to catch up to us. But the truth is, uh, you know, history does uh, repeat itself. And I'm just curious, in your view, is the current generation of younger people less knowledgeable about history and civics than they were when you were younger or when George Washington was younger? Is it really different or is it about the same as it always has been? Well, I think that in some ways, the opportunities to learn history aren't as emphasized as much as when I was younger. Um, and civics was something that was crucially important to us and shaped my life candidly. 
Um, so I think that the challenge here is to recognize that you can't teach history the same way all the time. That what you have to do is find the right tension between tradition and innovation. Um, so therefore you're engaging younger audiences. What I'm always struck by is that when I talk to kids that are the age of my daughters, once you begin to talk about the importance of history, they get it um, because they're looking for anchors to help them live their lives. They're looking for things that help them understand how issues of gender have always shaped the country and how they're dealing with it. So for me, I see a lot of young kids who are really interested in this. The challenge is to make sure that you teach history in a way like Ken does in his films. First of all, what his films do is they humanize big stories. They humanize grand themes. So people can then understand this through the, through the eyes of Jackie Robinson, say. Um, and then what's crucially important for many of the young kids that I talk to is help me understand why it matters. What do I really learn? Don't tell me about the dates that I need to know. Help me understand the context. Help me understand what history gives me. Help me understand why it's important to understand civics. So for me, it's about answering those questions and then allowing people to reap the joy of learning from the past. Have you been surprised that it sometimes seems as if immigrants to our country know more about the history of our country than people born here? And that's this various tests kind of indicate that. Has that been a surprise to you, Lonnie? Well, you know, I'm always struck when I talk to students and, and even young adults and what they don't know. Um, just the other day, somebody was asking me about what country did Malcolm Detect's 10th rule, um, you know, instead of Malcolm X. So in many ways, I think when I look at the civics to test or I look at the citizenship test, I wish all Americans had to take that test because in many ways, it really gets to the heart of the debates that are in America, it gets to the heart of what kinds of goals we had, and it gets to the heart of why it's important to remember. Because I think that in many ways, you can tell a great deal about a country by what it forgets, but also by what it remembers. And history helps us to remember. So Ken, when you do a, uh, one of your documentaries, do you know as much about the uh, subject matter at the beginning as you do at the end, or do you learn in the process? And what you learned, does that amaze you or you're not that amazed anymore? It's the latter and it's still, it's still so exciting. You know, I, I realized when I select a subject that I could take um, an expository route and describe to you what you should know, what I know, and therefore you should know, instead of telling a story and letting me share with you a process of discovery. So the very first thing we do on any project, whether it's the Civil War, whether it's most recently Muhammad Ali, whether it's country music, is we check our own baggage at the door. And then we immerse ourselves for years and years and years discovering the intimate in the panoramic and the, the sort of universal in the specific. And those kind of tensions provide you with wonderful stories, little tiny bits of information that you didn't know that, that are the glue that holds together the complex themes that may be operating at a top-down level. You know, I, I'm, I'm interested in an emotional, not sentimental or nostalgic, but an emotional archaeology rather than and reject the dry dates and facts and events of the past. That emotional archaeology is the shard, are, are the, is the glue that holds, as Lonnie was saying, those shards together and give them meaning. So every, every film that I've ever made is a process of sharing our process of discovery. And we don't have a set research period followed by a set writing period followed by, you know, a script, you know, informing both the shooting and the editing. We never stop researching and we never stop writing. And so everything is fresh up into the end and you never lose your enthusiasm for it. Uh, I, I, I'm in the last days of promoting a film that's on right now. And there's a kind of bittersweet sadness uh, that as I'm sure Lonnie felt the day it opened, you're, you're going to be happy as you watch the faces of the children that go through. But at the same time, that process is everything. And the process in our case is realizing as, as Lonnie was saying, is that history is not fixed, it's malleable. 
changing, not just as new information arrives or new artifacts are there to prove or disprove something, but as our own inclination and interest change. Each generation rediscovers and remakes that part of the past which gives the present meaning. And so we have to be nimble as museum makers and we have to be nimble as filmmakers understanding the way, understanding and rejoicing in that malleability. We somehow perceive that the past is open. I mean, the future is open and, and unknowable and thick and, and unfixed and malleable and that the past is suddenly, you know, rigid and it's the opposite. We kind of know what we're going to do for the rest of the day, don't we know? And yet the past is open to new interpretations. And what Lonnie's suggesting, and I think it's key to how we've tried to do in our film, is that if you pull back the camera and permit the lens to see things from many different perspectives, you have the opportunity to triangulate. And you're not excluding anyone's history, you're including everyone's history. So, you know, if we're having an argument about monuments to the Confederacy, it's really important important to know when they went up. They all went up at a time of the reimposition of white uh, supremacy, uh, the rise of Jim Crow laws and the advent of the Ku Klux Klan when Reconstruction collapsed, right? And that Robert E. Lee himself said, make no monuments to the Confederacy. It will only breed bitterness. So if anybody's having an argument now, if you've gone into the past and done your homework, you now can explain to people, that thing needs to go down, that needs to go into a museum, that needs to be reinterpreted in just this fashion. And then you haven't said your history is meaningless, it's just said we've got a complicated history. You know, I mentioned South Carolina before, they understand it. Their tourism is now bent not just inviting people to some old antiquated antebellum, you know, Spanish moss draping, you know, this this thing sentimental version. They're they're after the African Americans. This was a state that had a majority African American population, the center of the slave trade in the United States. And so realizing that, they've broadened the lens again and invited a, an incredibly diverse history, and it works for South Carolina. So, uh, Lonnie, uh, you are building uh, two new museums. Uh, why do we need more museums in Washington, D.C.? Don't we have enough museums? Do you know, it's like saying, do we have enough Civil War battlefields? Because for me, what the Smithsonian can do is use different museums to give people different portals into what it means to be an American so that you can come to the Smithsonian and understand American through an African-American lens, or really through the technology of the Air and Space Museum. And when you build the Latino Museum or the Women's History Museum, as long as they're two-sided coins, as long as they're the opportunity to, to go deeply into a subject, to tell stories that people don't know, but then to use those stories as the lens, understand what it means to be an American, then you've got this opportunity to say, the Smithsonian gives you different portals. And by entering those different portals, we get to the same place. We get to understand who we once were, who we are now, and can point us towards a better tomorrow. So for me, building museums, especially part of the Smithsonian, is really a way to open the doors for even more to understand America's past and understand America's presence. So Lonnie, you're a great historian and you've obviously built a great museum and now you're running all of the Smithsonian. Have your two daughters been able to get into history or you haven't been able to spread your daughters to get into, go into history? Um, let's put it this way. My oldest daughter um, is, was a gifted writer as a child and I said, oh, you could be a really good historian. And she said, dad, I wanna make a little money. Um, so she's an attorney. Um, my youngest daughter who loves telling stories, but she realized for her, history was wonderful, but it wasn't immediate enough. So she's an emergency medicine doctor. Um, so I've raised kids that are much smarter than I am, but they all have emergency. a pretty past. Emergency medicine is pretty immediate, I would say that. So uh, what about you, Ken? Do you have children interested in uh, filmmaking or history? Oh, I'm so happy to report. Yes, uh, David, I have four daughters. 
uh, two are grown with children of their own. And my oldest daughter, Sarah, I have been collaborating with her and her husband, David McMahon. In fact, the, Mar the Muhammad Ali film is co-directed by them uh, and also co-written by Sarah and Dave. And I, I had a laissez-faire interest in it. I was never going to push what I did at all. And, and all of my kids have sort of organically uh, gravitated towards that. My second daughter is, is in film production and, and does a lot of really wonderful things on the, on the non-history side of things, but in the entertainment storytelling business. Uh, but it, it's one of the great joys of my life to be able to work with my oldest and my, my two younger daughters seem to be headed in that direction as well, drawn to American studies, drawn to American history, curious about English, curious about how we tell our stories, how you articulate. And because they are of the generation that they are of, they're incredibly mindful of the tyranny of the past histories. When we all thought, even when Lonnie and I were growing up, that American history was just a sequence of presidential administrations punctuated, occupied by white men and punctuated by wars. And that was it. And there was nothing bottom up about that history, uh, except insofar as those great men, capital G, capital M, were concerned. So one of the things that was very important that's atrophied about that is when we stopped telling history, we even lost that foundational structure. You know, we make a joke now, George Washington slept here. In the 19th century, it was serious business for every school kid to know why he slept there. It had to do of this retreat from the British Army in Morristown, New Jersey, or what he was doing in Trent or how he crossed the death. Where he slept was hugely important to the very fact and existence of our country, and now it's a joke. And what I think both Lonnie and I want to do, and I think you do too, David, in your extraordinary work and generosity to, to what Lonnie and I do, uh, but also to so many other aspects of our civic lives, is to return fair value to all the stories. There are, you, you do not wish to throw out a top-down model at the same time you elevate a bottom-up one. That's just revisionism, and all of a sudden, everybody's wrong. And what we need to do is have an inclusive history. Those great men sometimes did good did do great things, but let us also remember the myriad heroic acts of other people that are, in fact, the, the DNA of our history. And that's what you know, the, the museums of the Smithsonian do, that's what we try to do in our films, is kind of find a way where the bottom up meets the top down. There's a story that the famous American historian and uh, professor Jill Lepore tells when she went to a grade school uh, to talk to uh, young children about history, and they asked, and asked them about the Revolutionary War, and she said to the uh, young ladies, the young girls there, what about the women at the time of the Revolutionary War? And the girls said, well, there weren't any women back then. And which means that they weren't really being taught what women were doing in those days because our history has been kind of, you know, as you know, homogenized to make it basically a few heroes, mostly white men uh, at that time. But and let me ask you a question about Vietnam. You and I lived through the Vietnam War and Lonnie did as well. And when the Vietnam War was going on, the country was bitterly divided. When you came out with your series on that, um, you made it clear that the politicians knew all along we couldn't win the war militarily, but they basically kept this going on for the point where 58,000 Americans lost their lives. Was it controversial that you pointed out that this war was known to be unwinnable militarily and that, uh, you know, the, the country was deceived? Was that at that time, the, the, your documentary came out, was that controversial or at that time, basically people had moved on? It's so interesting, you know, I think that the seeds of the current disunion and divisiveness that we experience today really had some seeds, obviously going all the way back to the beginning of the country, but really were, were these were embers that have recently been blown on that were there from Vietnam. And we presuppose, we assumed that there would be a great deal of controversy to the film, even though it had been uh, administrations from both political parties that had lied, beginning with Truman. Eisenhower, particularly Kennedy, and most particularly Johnson and Nixon, and to an even lesser extent, Ford in the in the final denouement. So you're, you've got a lot of different presidents involved and a lot of different hard fact evidence of that. And so we created, in the spirit of a kind of political campaign, a war room of Democrats and Republicans and political operatives that would come not to our rescue, but would help uh, sort of guide the debate. 
they, they cobwebs grew on them. People found out such new information about the war that it trumped, literally, literally trumped the, the inclination to revert to those dialectical positions, black, white, young, old, gay, straight, blue state, red state, Democrat, Republican, all the things we do to hide our sameness. You know, um, if, if I've been making films about the U.S. and us, the one thing that's really clear is that there's only us. There's no them. And I think what happened in the Vietnam film is that while I assume in the far, far left and the far, far right, there was dissatisfaction, the vast majority of people went, I did not know that. I now know about the Gulf of Tonkin incident in a way that I didn't know. I now understand this. I can appreciate the individual heroism of Marines, and I can also appreciate the moral courage of those people who refused to serve, as Muhammad Ali in our current documentary didn't. And so we were pleasantly surprised. And, and unfortunately, though, there's not enough of that kind of storytelling. Everybody is now self-selecting where they want to get their stories. And most of their stories, it is, there's a kind of almost political uh, um, expediency to them that permits people to accentuate the differences, to create thems. And I always say, it's only us. And if anybody tells you there's a them, run away from them because that's not what we're about. This is what the nature of e pluribus unum is. It's what the story of our country could be that when we, when we, ex when we celebrate our potential ex uh, exceptionalism, it's that aspect of us, not the other aspects. And I am in fact, working on a film right now on the American Revolution, which is not the American Revolution that you, David, or you, Lonnie, or I was taught. This is not 55 white guys in Philadelphia and Minutemen on Lexington Green. This is a ragtag army. This is about diplomacy. This is about women. This is about native peoples being systematically dispossessed of their lands. It's about free blacks. It's about enslaved black people. It's about people who remained loyal uh, to the British crown, uh, uh, at least a fifth, if not a quarter of the population. This was a civil war. Our civil war had very few civilian deaths outside of Missouri and, and Kansas. Um, it was a sectional war. Our American Revolution, as anyone in 96, which is a, lo a location in South Carolina or, or Portsmouth, New Hampshire, can tell you was a horrific civil war. And it is in time that we try to back up the camera and show all of the stories of that. And I am going to have to avail myself almost every day of that production uh, with, with Lonnie's expertise and his many museums. So we have about two minutes left. Lonnie, uh, just briefly, when um, African Americans go through the African American History and Culture Museum, what are they most amazed with? Uh, the history of their country that they didn't know about? Or what is, is it something else? Well, I think that when visitors go through, African Americans, first of all, feel they're coming home. That somebody is saying the complexity of their lives is worthy of a museum. And I see people really grappling with slavery first and foremost, because that was one of the things we were uncomfortable with. Should we talk about slavery? Is slavery just something to be embarrassed about? And I suddenly see African Americans really embracing their, their enslaved ancestors. But what I also love is watching non-African Americans go through. They all say, I didn't know that. But what they do is they find common ground. They find heroes. They find people who fought to make America live up to its stated ideals. And so what you end up doing is having people come through and they're changed because they find each other in the African American past. So my final question to Ken, um, you know, my favorite question to you is you have this famous haircut that you now <laughs> don't have. You've had this kind of haircut. You had a, a same barber for, I think, 35 or 40 years. Uh, how come you have a different haircut all of a sudden? I don't recognize you. Well, it's COVID. And I, I think after hearing that question from you so many times, I thought I'd give you a glimpse of my forehead, which hadn't been seen since the, the late 60s. But if I could add one thing, David, to this is a quote that I discovered recently in, in an article that I had never come across before. Lonnie will probably recognize it instantly. I won't read the whole thing. But the quote goes, all life is interrelated. All people are caught in an inescapable network 
of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be, and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. The speaker was Dr. Martin Luther King, and I can't think of anything that rationalizes, in the best sense of that word, the need for history, the need for civics, the need for museums, and the need for these kinds of conversations. We are all in this together, and there is no escaping the fact that we are tied in a single garment of destiny. And the work that Lonnie does, the work that I do, and David, you're as the interlocutor have been modest about your own work, that is the work that you do, is to try to remind us of this single garment of destiny, this, this network of mutuality, inescapable network of mutuality. Well, I want to thank you for a great conversation, a great way to end that, Ken. And Ken and Lonnie, keep up the great work you're doing on behalf of our country and on behalf of everybody that cares about history and civics. But it's, it's been a great uh, to talk to you, and thank you very much for giving us this time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye.